I've been seeing all these comments saying that I should talk about Sony and oh, holy cow, Sony has a lot going on. So much going on in so many different areas. They're on the global 500 list at number 97, meaning in 2018 they were the 97th largest company in the world. That spot is up from the past few years, but actually quite a bit down from their top spot a few years before that. And there can probably be a video at some point that focuses on the reasons behind these ups and downs, but with so many different things happening with Sony, the reasons are hard to pinpoint. But even if they're lower than they once were, they're still huge. Their revenue last year was over $77 billion. So I want to ask, how do you think of Sony? When I say the name, what comes to your mind? For me, it's a TV or a Blu-ray player or something like that, maybe a pair of headphones. But for many others watching this, I imagine it's the PlayStation, right? Sony PlayStation? Now, what if I were to tell you of that $77 billion in sales in 2018, less than half of that was from everything I just mentioned. Everything involving PlayStations and televisions and sound is not even half of their business. Well under half. It's actually more like a third. And I think that makes Sony a great topic for this series and a great company to talk about in general. The beginnings of Sony take place in post-World War II Japan. And I mean, it started immediately following the war. The official Japanese surrender date marking the end of the war was September of 1945. The date the company that would later morph into Sony was established was October of 1945. See, during the war, there was this Japanese man named Masaru Ibuka who worked for a team of engineers for a company that would test and produce new military equipment. When the war ended, that company shut down, so Ibuka and a team of 20 or so engineers set out to start a new company in Tokyo. Now, as you may know, Tokyo and Japan in general was not in the best condition following World War II. At the very least, we can say that these were unusual circumstances to be starting a business. For example, their original location was on the third floor of a department store that had visible bomb damage on the outside, but it was still standing and obviously still functional. In fact, the impression I get anyway is that one of the main reasons the founders had for starting this new business was to help get Japan back on their feet, become a part of a growing economy, and help the people along the way. So here we have a group of engineers looking to sell something in a very weak economy. They had to figure out how they can use their skills in a way that would benefit the Japanese citizens. Their idea was to focus on radios. For one, they're engineers, so it's something they can handle, and for two, there was a huge demand for them. We're talking about a country immediately following a massive war. I would say that's a time to follow the daily news. The war caused damage to a lot of people's radios, so a major part of their business was to repair these radios. Videos. The other part of their business was producing shortwave converters. Shortwave radios are pretty cool. They can tune into different frequencies and receive transmissions from much further away, essentially from anywhere in the world. Again, immediately following a world war, the people of Japan understandably were curious to hear what was going on around the world. Ibuka and his crew saw the demand for these shortwave radios, so they made this shortwave converter that made regular radios into shortwave radios. It's a perfect example of examining a specific area, identifying their needs, and using a set of skills to fill it. These new adapters had such initial success that they were featured in a popular Japanese news column. I mention this because it further helped their popularity, but also because a man named Akio Morita saw the article. See, Ibuka and Morita had known each other during the war, and reading about the success of the new product motivated him to contact Ibuka and eventually become his business partner. In May of the next year, the partnership formed a new company called TTK. But keep in mind, this was such a small company. Company. Its starting capital was the equivalent of $500, and it didn't do very well at first. Early on, they made this rice cooker that just turned out to be a complete failure. You can probably blame that failure on the lack of resources. It was pretty simple, just this wooden bowl with an electrical component at the bottom. The rice would usually come out undercooked or overcooked, depending on a bunch of factors. I imagine they had trouble testing the product sufficiently because there was a huge food shortage at the time, and apparently the rice that they used for their test was obtained on the 
black market, in their first year, TTK's profit was $300. Here's what I would say were their three biggest problems at the time. For one, they were selling in a weak economy. I mean, if no one has money to buy anything, how can you sell anything? For two, they had very little money or physical resources. It's hard to develop and produce things with no money. And three, they struggled to find a core product, something that you can build your business around. And it certainly wasn't that rice maker. By 1950, things were looking better. For one, the economy was getting better. It was five years removed from the war. The people of Japan had more money and were looking to spend more. As far as their resources, again, we're a few years into the business, still getting by and growing along the way, plus Marita's father started providing some money. As far as finding the right product, in 1950, they introduced the first Japanese tape recorder. If you lived in Japan in 1950 and wanted a tape recorder, you'd be contacting TTK. And they did an effective job in making people want the tape recorder by advertising all of its uses. In 1955, they further took shape when they started producing transistor radios, one of the first to do it, and they became known for it. The company was still called TTK at this point, but decided to call the radio Sony. After three years, the radio was such a success and the name Sony became so popular they decided to make that the name of the entire company. That's the first decade of Sony, a rough start, but it's easy to see how they got involved in audio and electronics, so at this point, I would normally want to continue the story and talk about how they got involved in different products and industries and how they developed, but it's a little difficult with Sony. There's over 60 more years to cover, and over that time, they've expanded into one of the world's largest companies. They're in virtually every country and have a significant presence in multiple industries. They have all these subsidiaries dealing with different businesses. It's just impossible to talk about all of it in detail in a video like this. They have nine separate reporting segments, most of which can easily have their own videos. So for now, let's look at them from a higher level and get at least a basic understanding of what Sony does today. Their biggest segment is the one that you would expect, game and network services, coming in at 22% of their revenue. This is everything that has to do with PlayStation. The consoles, the games, the network services, everything from research and development to customer service. They've been selling about 20 million PlayStations every year. Their second largest segment is financial services, almost 14% of their revenue. In 1979, they formed a joint venture with the insurance company Prudential. It was called Sony Prudential Life Insurance. But then in 1991, they changed the name to Sony Life Insurance, and in 1996, became 100% owner. So that's part of the segment of the company, along with Sony Bank, they have an actual bank, along with a bunch of other financial services. The third largest segment is home entertainment and sound. This is what I first thought of when I heard Sony. That's your 65-inch 4K TVs and Blu-ray players, Walkmans, headphones, and everything along those lines. They sell about 12 million televisions every year. Their next largest segment is labeled as pictures, providing 11.4% of their revenue. Here we're talking about TV and movies. In 1989, they acquired Columbia Pictures Entertainment, which is a big production company. It cost them $3.4 billion. You see their name before a lot of movies, that lady holding her arm in the air. When you see all those different logos before movies, a lot of them are owned by Sony, like TriStar. They have that horse with the wings coming at you. And then there's Sony Pictures animation, just a lot of subsidiaries they own that have to do with the production and distribution of movies. Just here's an example, do you know this movie Spider-Man Into the Spider-Verse? Well, it's produced by Columbia Pictures and Sony Pictures Animation and distributed by Sony Pictures Releasing, of course, all owned by Sony. And I only talked about movies here, but they do the exact same thing for TV. This is one of those segments that you can really dig into, but let's go on to number five, semiconductors. In the 1980s, they started making making electronics components for other companies, and today it's almost 10% of their business. Next up, music. It's 9% of their business. Oh boy, there's a lot going on here too. They're responsible for the distribution of both physical and digital music. They got involved with this very early on. In 
1968, they formed a joint venture with CBS called CBS Sony Records, where they shared 50-50 ownership. In 1988, they became 100% owner and three years later changed the name to Sony Music Entertainment. And aside from that, they also deal in music publishing, which has to do with who owns the rights to songs and licensing and royalties and everything like that. In 1995, they formed a 50-50 joint venture, this time with Michael Jackson, called Sony ATV Music Publishing, which today is the world's number one music publisher. In 2016, Sony became the full owner of it. Next is mobile communications, 8.2% of revenue. This is smartphones and tablets. In 2001, Sony Ericsson was formed, yet another joint venture, this time with the Swedish company Ericsson. And then Sony bought Ericsson share in 2012 and renamed it Sony Mobile Communications. They sold over 12 million smartphones in 2018. Next is imaging products and solutions at 7.4% of their revenue. This includes cameras and lenses, along with video cameras for consumers and professionals, projectors, and even a bunch of medical devices used for imaging. In 2013, they formed a business with Olympus called Sony Olympus Medical Solutions. And the remaining 4.6% is labeled under all other and includes everything else. This is disc manufacturing is a big one. It used to include computers, but then they got rid of that in 2014, and it used to include batteries, but they got rid of that in 2017. So, that's it. That's where all their money came from in 2018. And you have to admit, there's more going on here than you thought. Isn't there one other thing that may help prove that Sony is bigger than you know? I've been showing their revenue broken down by segment, but what about their revenue broken down by region? The greatest portion of their sales comes from Japan, followed by Europe and the US, which are virtually tied, followed by Asia Pacific and China. This proves a couple of things. It shows how that little radio repair business in post-war Tokyo has done pretty well in expanding their reach over the years, but it also shows how there's a lot going on with Sony outside of your area. Let me know in the comments, what do you think of Sony? They had such modest beginnings and seemingly good intentions, and were able to turn it all into something so big, constantly expanding into new products and new locations and new industries, to a point where today they're one of the largest and most diverse companies out there. And let me know if you'd be interested in a video that takes a more in-depth look on some of these segments, because there's a lot more to talk about. And anything else you have to say about Sony, the PlayStation, or whatever else, leave it in the comments. I'd like to hear what you have to say. Thank you for watching.